believe it or not, there are players in the league that are much more stat driven than winning lists. Oh, I believe that. I, I watched the Cleveland Browns uh, yeah. for 20 years. My name is Sir Yacht, and I'm on a mission to interview every Cleveland Browns starting quarterback since 1999. We know their names and we've seen them struggle, but do we know their side of the story? This is Since 99. Time by the Browns! The Cleveland Browns have won the game! For our next interview, we go to Birmingham, Alabama to talk to the only former Browns quarterback to ever start and win a Super Bowl. We now welcome on Super Bowl champion, 14-year NFL vet, uh, former ESPN analyst, and current UAB head football coach, Trent Dilfer. Trent, it is an honor. I'm really excited to talk to you. One, because you've done just about everything you can in and around the sport <laughs> of uh, the game of football, and two, uh, you had a lot of adversity uh, going in in your NFL career, and you didn't, you didn't back out. You just kept going. You never gave up, and that's something I've always really admired from you. So I appreciate it. Thanks again for the time. Really appreciate it. I'm fired up. Let's talk. So you are the only person in NFL history to ever start in a Super Bowl, mm -hmm. win a Super Bowl, and also be a starting quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. So elite company right there. Just really? Yourself. Yeah. I did not know. I knew. No other person has ever been a Cleveland Browns quarterback and won a Super Bowl while they're starting. We've had backups and stuff like yeah. that, but you are the person that led the charge. So I wish I would have played better in my time in Cleveland. Well, I mean, as we've learned, talking to all these quarterbacks and stuff, it's uh, it's not necessarily the quarterback's fault. It's been <laughs> it's been the organization's fault. I guess let's go back to when you were uh, growing up in, in Santa Cruz. I believe you were the son of a uh, football coach. Mm -hmm. uh, was football just always in your DNA? Did you always have the dream of playing in the NFL? It was. I had two dads. My birth father lived in town. I split time with him. My stepdad, Frank, was the football coach, played at Cal. Uh, high school football coach, then went on to be a junior college football coach. Has some chances to coach at the major college level. Didn't do it uh, so he could stay back and, and be part of my development. Grew up around it all the time. I grew up as the ball boy. Um, gym rat, you know, rode junior college buses in the back to away games and clean lockers and played mud football at halftime. And really, I tell people I'm 51 and I've had a 43-year football life because it started when I was eight. And... Um, really have been around the game at all different levels ever since. That's awesome. You had a, it seemed like everything you did in high school, every sport that you touched, you were just really, really good at. You're a great basketball player, a great golf player. It's funny, we actually just, we were in uh, Arizona talking to Derek Anderson, and he said you're the reason Derek. that he has a golfing addiction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then you were also really, really good at football. I think you were all county and all league as a quarterback, a defensive back, and is it true that you were a punter as well? Yeah, and punt returner. I actually was not a very good quarterback. Um, Many of you are like shocked by that. I'm kidding. That's sarcasm. <laughs> um, I I was I was a big, strong, athletic kid that always had a ball in mm -hmm. his hand, um, and you know it, it was small ball, small high school ball. wasn't real uh, big time, so you know he kind of put me wherever the ball needed to go. Mm -hmm. Had another really good player on the team. Uh, so the two of us kind of traded responsibilities offensively. Really, I was a better defensive player. I was really just an athlete playing football. Uh, I was being recruited more as a basketball player, kind of that lower Division One level, St. Mary, Santa Clara, Gonzaga before they were Gonzaga, mm -hmm. you know, that, that area, that level. Um, and then – but I loved football, and, and I, I knew I was going to get better. I, I just hadn't been uh, trained a lot. So – um, Fresno took a chance on me by letting an athlete play quarterback, and it, it turned out all right. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say you did three really big things at Fresno or in your time at Fresno. First, obviously, you were the starting quarterback there. Two, you met your wife, Cass, there. Yep. She was a swimmer there. And yep. three, going into your sophomore year, I believe, you attended a fellowship of Christian athletes mm -hmm. camp. Uh, you were brought on as a counselor. Uh, but I read some articles, and it said you just really learned about Christianity or learned more about it and really grew, grew closer to Christ there. Can you talk about, I suppose, your faith and uh, how that maybe that camp kind of changed the trajectory of everything that you're yeah. doing now? Yeah, thanks for teeing me up there. You're it's welcome. It's unusual to have the media to team me up Well, I'm not direction. really media, so there you okay. go. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my life was radically changed in Fresno. Football crew was great, allowed me to go on and play professional football, but more importantly, met my wife, Cassandra Cass. I uh, went to a camp, and it was the first time I had seen um, – my peers really living for the Lord. Like I, I had come to know the Lord when I was 10. I did the typical, you know, junior high, kind of high school, go to youth group, you know, try to figure this thing out. But I really didn't understand kind of giving up my life. 
And I saw these guys do it, you know, these guys and gals that were my peers, that were my age, and I was attracted to it. I'm like, I, I want to I wanna live like that. Although I was having a lot of success in football and having success in school and, you know, all that stuff, I was empty. You know, I didn't feel like I had a purpose. I didn't feel like I had uh, passion for anything. And, and this was the first time I kind of was like, whoa, okay, I see what this thing's all about. And, and that was really when I, I, when I tell people is I put both feet in with my relationship with the Lord. And um, I've had plenty of struggles since, but uh, really been tracking with him ever since. Obviously, you've experienced so many things in, in the NFL, uh, but let's, let's go back to 1994. Uh, you know, we're going up to the NFL draft. Mm -hmm. It's happening. Uh, the Colts pass on you twice. Mel Kuyper says that's a mistake. The GM says, who in the hell is Mel Kuyper? That's a... Who in the hell is Mel Kuyper? And Do you know the story there? Have you read the story there? I've read a little bit, but if you want to talk more yeah, about so it, Yeah, so I've said it. I, when I was at ESPN, I told the story. I feel bad for both. You know, it's it gets played every year, and I'm like, I wish they'd stop playing that because I've actually told the story. You know, the Colts wanted to draft me um, after Marshall. And my agent at the time felt as if, right or wrong, the Colts were a really bad organization for a quarterback to go to. Um, so he had told them that I wouldn't sign with them. And my leverage was that the next year was expansion. The next year was the mm -hmm. Carolina Panthers coming in the league. And I already been told I'd be the first pick of the draft if I held out a year. And we were steadfast. Like, I was going to hold out the whole year if, oh, wow. the, if the Colts took me. One, because Carolina was pretty attractive a year later. Uh, two, back then, you made a lot of money as a rookie before you ever got drafted. Mm -hmm. My agent had told the Colts, don't draft me, he was going to sit out. So he was put in an impossible situation. One, he couldn't say it publicly because it makes the Colts look bad oh if he God, says that. that. And two, you know, and Mel doesn't know that. Mel's a dear friend, and, you know, mm -hmm. he doesn't know that the Colts have been told that by my agent. So um, it, it, I always feel bad when I see that clip. Everybody laughs at it, and and I'm like, ooh, you know, we put them in a terrible situation. I, I do really regret that. You know, if I were to go back and do it all over again, uh, my wife and I have talked about it, we would not have allowed our agents to say that. You know, who are we to decide who drafts us and who's a good organization, who's a bad organization? But at the time... That was kind of the game that was being played, and, and that's why the Colts didn't take me. Well, I'm sure they forgave you because they got paid Manning. A few yeah, not a bad so deal. Yeah, I'm it, sure it it's, the, it's the best thing ever happened to <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe it's just thank you. <laughs> Talk to me, I guess, about your time in Tampa. I always call it a roller coaster. Now, the roller coaster I remember the most. You know, it's, it's probably the most vivid memories I have in the NFL. Um, it was brutally hard the first couple of years. First three years was just torture. Um, I didn't handle it very well. I wasn't ready for um, the responsibility that came with being the the CEO of the organization, you know, which the quarterback is. Um, I had a lot of head knowledge, uh, but I didn't have a lot of practical application to that knowledge. Um, we weren't any good. So, you know, it, it was hard. I wasn't any good and we weren't any good. You know, that's a bad combination. Uh, I also did some things I really regret. You know, it, quarterback is a craftsman sport to a certain degree, much like golf, right? You hone your golf swing. You hone your, your throwing mechanics so that you can be consistent. And I didn't do that. I tweaked around some stuff. I tried to be something I wasn't. I had very good fundamentals coming in, and they just deteriorated in a short amount of time. Uh, my confidence went down. I wasn't a very good leader. Uh, I wasn't working as hard as I had worked in college. Um, it just kind of spiraled on me. And, and Tony in 96, uh, in fact, we just had him out here to UAB to speak to our coaches. Oh, awesome. Um, dear friend. And what he did was he breathed life into me again. You know, he there was accountability and there was a standard. And if I didn't meet that standard, I wasn't going to be the quarterback. But if I did, he was going to give me some time. And he said, hey, we, we need to put better people around you. We need to play better defense around you. We need you to have time to, to grow back and become a version of what you were when you got drafted. So uh, he really breathed life back into me. And it started clicking the end of 96. You know, the end of 96 is when, although statistically it didn't show up, you could start feeling it on the team. And you can start, I started feeling it again. And then the offseason before 97, um, got my body right, um, got some of the technique stuff back. And then 97 played pretty pretty well. You know, we played well as a team, um, played pretty well as a quarterback. Now, I don't know if I deserve to be a Pro Bowler. It's nice that I have that one Pro Bowl in my 14-year career. But uh, 
Yeah, I think it was more of a product of the team's success. A lot of injuries in Tampa kind of ended your uh, time there. You get signed on a one-year contract to Baltimore, mm -hmm. and we all know the history of, you know, you come in and uh, lead the team to a Super Bowl. Obviously, on the record, just you, for whatever reason, because, maybe because you were playing with a stout defense, you didn't get as much credit as you should have. Well, I don't know about that. I, you know, I don't get upset. When people say that I managed that, because I really did. You know, early on when I took over for Tony, uh, we played at a pretty high level offensively to kind of get the ship going mm -hmm. again. Uh, but then we realized, you know, we we could never lose a game if we're just smart offensively. Like if we don't we don't give the other team the game, we're not gonna lose. That's like, a nice no, yeah, nobody's gonna score on this defense. Nobody's gonna. Uh, nobody's going to march the ball on us. We're having plenty of opportunities offensively. So we got ultra conservative, and, and it was intentional. Um, you know, it, it, more games are kind of given away in football than actually gone and won. And our philosophy was like, they're eventually, the other team's eventually going to give the game away. And, and I didn't play it at super high level. I made some good plays. I made some good decisions. I made some bad plays and some bad decisions. But I think ultimately – what I was able to do was kind of be a rock in that offense that allowed us to be who we needed to be. And again, was able to be selfless and not worry about personal accolades or stats or whatever it is and make decisions that, that were about winning, not about accumulation of stats. Yeah. And believe it or not, there are players in the league that are much more stat-driven than winning league. Oh, I believe that. I, I watched the Cleveland Browns uh, yeah. for 20 years. I, I can see that yeah, Exactly. I mean, they, they think about their contracts and bonuses and Pro Bowls and fame and now Twitter followers and Instagram followers and brand value. And and it, it's really sad because it, it, it deteriorates teams because mm -hmm. the greatest teams have people that are willing to say, hey, you're more important than me. You know, I'll do this on your behalf. Yep. Your success is our success. And that's really what we had in, in Baltimore. And, and I, I do believe that I was one of the reasons for that. Was I the reason for it? Heck no. But I was one of the reasons. Um, and, and then it'd just be stupid. Like, I tell people, like, you'd be stupid if you had that defense, if you had that group of people. It's not just the defense and their pro productivity but who they were, like they're the greatest of all time and great dudes and tough guys and locker room leaders, like to not say, hey, why don't you be the lead in this movie? You guys be the lead and, and we'll be the supporting cast and we're totally cool with that. If we get a if we get an Emmy because for a supporting actor role, yeah. I'm all good with that. And that's ultimately what we did. Absolutely. So what was it? I, I gotta ask as a Cleveland Browns fan. Emmy or Oscar? I don't even know. The it's difference. one of the two. I don't know. Perfect. I just it's went along with it. Awards. It sounded good. Yeah. It sounded good. It was Perfect. like in the thing in Animal House when they say, "Not now, he's on a roll." Um, <laughs> what was it like? I gotta ask as a Browns fan, not experiencing. What is it like just playing in a Super Bowl and winning it? That it just f viewing it, I get nerves, and my team's never in it. I couldn't imagine being the guy starting and playing in that game. You know, you have to prepare yourself for it. I, you know, people forget this too. I just spent six years in Tampa. I go to Baltimore and the Super Bowl's is in, in Tampa, Tampa yeah. in Raymond James. So there was a lot of other stuff uh, heading into that game. Mm -hmm. And I had to do a really good job. Now, now at this point, Mark Graham, I'm very mature. I've gained some wisdom. Um, I do have practical knowledge and application to the things I've learned. So I feel like I'm ready for this. And, and I was emotionally. I, I, I handled it very well. Uh, the week, the distractions, the game itself. I think you have to protect yourself from not getting caught up in the moment. Mm -hmm. We knew we were better than the Giants, not taking, away, taking anything away from the Giants. But as we watched them on film, we're like, we're, we're significantly better than this team. Um, if we just play sound, fundamental football – and don't get caught up and do stupid stuff, we're going to be just fine. And, and that's what we did. We just played really soundly, um, didn't take too many chances. So was it difficult the next season? No, I guess, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe you got a chance to – No, I was a free agent. So starting quarterback The position. way that worked was I was a free agent at the end of the year because I'd signed that one-year deal. I thought I'd be coming back. Actually, midseason they talked about a contract extension, and I said, eh, you know, let's wait till after the season. I never once thought, not, not one time – did ever cross my mind that I might not be the quarterback there the next year. Uh, and then I get a call. We're actually headed to the ESPYs. My wife and I are headed to the ESPYs to represent the team as the team of the year. And I get a call um, from Matt Cavanaugh that, you know, I'm number three on their list of free agents. 
and he's very apologetic. He was my quarterback coach, offense coordinator. Um, he, he didn't necessarily agree with it. I've said this on, on camera. I think it's the one thing that I still maybe hold a little bitterness to. Maybe none now, but for years I did. Mm -hmm. um, it hurt. You know, I think I love hard things. I have two, two signs that sit in my office. Uh, they're really the two core principles I've built my football life around, which is the edge of uncomfortable is where you find greatness and do hard things. Like, go find hard things and do them. It'll, it'll make you a better player, person, coach, whatever. And I thought being uncomfortable and doing hard would have been trying to repeat. Like, it fit into my paradigm of the two things that I want to do more than anything else in the world was go prove that I was more than what I had been the year before, that we could do it again, that we were only going to be better the next year. I'd already started thinking about all that stuff uh, in the off season, and then to not get a chance – to do that was extremely painful. Uh, and to watch it the next year was brutal because that was for sure hard knocks. I don't want to be like whatever, but obviously I wear the uh, the rival's colors. So it, it was nice for, uh, <laughs> I mean, but I was like eight years old, so it didn't really matter. It didn't really click with me then, but no, I'm just messing. Um, so you go to Seattle, you spend, I believe, four seasons there. You yep. develop a great friendship with Matt Hasselbeck. Uh, talk to me about the transition of going from playing in the Super Bowl, starting winning to, uh, I, I suppose, just backing him up. Yeah, that was um, that was interesting, man. Like, you go from being the starting quarterback in the Super Bowl and going to Disneyland to a free agent on the street that there's not a lot of starting jobs. Um, and you're like, okay, I'm going to be a backup. Cool. I, I can – I'll fight my way through again. Uh, but what do I really need for my career? What do I need? And I said, okay, let's do this. Let's, 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 it's year eight now. Let's go chase my best. Let's go see how good I can be. My body's beat up. Yeah. I'm probably not the athlete I once was, but I have a lot of this, you know, a lot of wisdom in the position and, and mm -hmm. let's go see how good I can be and, and help. If I don't win the job, let's help somebody reach their potential. That medical staff uh, in Seattle is one of the best medical staffs helped get my body right. You know, I was hurt the whole year in Baltimore. They didn't figure out what it was. Seattle figured out what well, something it was. Well, something to you, you played in the, the whole played season. Played the whole Super season Bowl. hurt. Injured, yeah. Um, and then got to Seattle and they figured out what it was. Once they figured that out, I, God, I felt so much better. I got stronger. You know, the term I'd use for those four years is pretty fruitful. You know, it, it, the casual fan's going to look and go, eh, you know, whatever. But it was the start of really a paradigm shift for me on football, uh, which I think eventually has led me into what I'm doing now coaching because I really became a player coach. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, April 27th of this year was the 20th anniversary Oop. of your son, Trevin's passing at the age of five. Um, I, I've seen interviews where he called himself uh, Trevin to the rescue, yeah. a superhero. Uh, he just uh, – even everything that he went through with his heart disease and stuff, he was very uh, – he just cared about everybody else. In he the did. Room. He wanted everybody to feel good. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, how do you want Trevin uh, – how do you want people to remember remember Trevin? You know, I don't know if I've been asked that question. Um, you know, he died when he was five and a half. Uh, so I don't know how – you know, not many people knew him. So his legacy is carried on, I think, through our family. And what our family's tried to do is – treat others as he's he treated people and and he was about unity and think of our country right now like we don't have unity no. and our family has really made a conscious effort to promote unity and promote healing and 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 um be unifiers in in, in tough situations um because he was um he was a peacemaker uh, i tell stories all the time that you know there'd be a conflict in the house and he'd, you know, that's when he'd put his cape on and be Trevin to the rescue. And his rescue was to come find peace. Sisters fighting, mom and dad arguing, whatever it is, he wanted to find peace. So as a family, we, we've decided to, to honor him by um, being a family that's that's looking to find peaceful resolutions, both internally and, and externally. So uh, his memory is hopefully carried out through us. Uh, I think as I coach, um, so much of how... I shape our programs, uh, how I shape the building uh, is around developing unity, is around finding peaceful resolutions to, to conflict, um, and hopefully carrying out his memory 
with how we, pre how we present ourselves to this world. So that season with the Achilles tear, and obviously with Trevin, um, very, very tough, just handling one of them, let alone both. Um, you are thinking about retiring. Matt Hauseback has a conversation with you to bring you back. And uh, I have a quote here that you said in an interview in 2005 of what he said to you. He's obviously going through a make or break contract year. And uh, he says to you, I thought a lot about my goals this season and my number one goal this year is to be the best friend that you've ever had. Yep, that was leading into the 2003 season. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he had everything on the line. And this is where I, I brag on Matthew all the time, any chance I can get. Um, he literally, it was the tipping point of his career. He was told going into that season that if he didn't play at a high level, they were going to move on. Um, and instead, his focus became he's going to be the best friend I've ever had. And it started in training camp. You know, just I, I was going to retire. I didn't. They get me. They coerce me up to get to Seattle for my health, for my family's health. Um, and in training camp, it was brutal. You know, I was away from my family for the first time. I still have this massive sorrow. Uh, I'm grieving. And, you know, Matthew wouldn't let me be alone. And, and you know, training camp's hard now. You you got two-a-days. And, well, back then it was hard, like country club now. But back then it was two hard practices. You're up early. You're up, uh, up early in the morning to start. You stay up late at night studying and having meetings. Um, your body's fatigued. Your mind's fatigued. Uh, it's relentless. It's a month long with maybe one day off a week. And instead of him taking care of himself, he was really taking care of me. Like he would come into my dorm room, uh, make sure that I was I was doing okay. We'd play video games. Yeah, like four in the morning, he yeah. would come in and he would just, he would yeah. hear me like crying in the other room because his his room was next to me, and he just wouldn't let me um, he wouldn't let me be alone uh, in a good way. And uh, you know, a bond was grown through that that I think is unbreakable. And, and it, I think he was rewarded too because he ended up really resurrecting his career and went on to have a fantastic NFL career. Mm -hmm. And it really launched that season. And it shows like when you when you do it for somebody else, it's actually more powerful than doing it for yeah. yourself. And let's talk, about your, uh, let's talk about your time in Cleveland. You were traded there. And uh, one thing that I think you've always said is you've been a guy that's had to meet your teammates and be involved in their lives early on. So you just did that. You, you went straight to Cleveland. Uh, what was it like going there? And I was the really excited about the Cleveland trade. I, in fact, it was hard to leave Seattle. Uh, we knew we were getting really good. In fact, they did. The next year they went to the Super Bowl. Um, but I just, that last year in 04, I started feeling like myself again. Mm -hmm. Like I started feeling like, oh, okay, I got some juice left. Um, and then Phil Savage was with me in Baltimore, and he's in Cleveland now, and we knew they were going to draft a quarterback, and it kind of seemed like the perfect opportunity to, to be like, oh, okay, I can go start again. Uh, if I play at a high level, it's my job. Yep. If I don't, I'll be able to be there and, and help mentor the next guy uh, and help change his franchise. Because even back then, they already had the quarterback <laughs> issues. So... I was pumped, and I was pumped about what they were. Uh, they had some talented players. Um, Romeo was exciting to play for. He just came from the, the whole New England thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was really excited about that, and I did. I jumped in. I, I moved from Seattle without my family to Cleveland, uh, jumped into the lives of my teammates, uh, established some great friendships, lived at the facility, uh, really tried to add a professionalism to the building. Um, and I think we did that. Uh, my body got, uh, I got in physical shape as, as much as I could at that point. You know, I had time I'd already dealt with a bunch of ish issues, mm -hmm. but got pretty strong and got fit, was throwing it great. Um, had really good coach, a uh, really good quarterback coach in Rip Shear, uh, who, by the way, coach he's is here, right? He's here with yeah. me now, uh, UAB. So that's awesome. Um, you know, felt really good about the things and, and actually was pretty proud of, of how we went through that process in the off season and training camp and felt like we were getting better. And, and unfortunately, my body just couldn't hold up. You know, I ended up tearing my uh, patella ligament and tried to play through it. And it was just, it was a disaster. And, you know, there's some other reasons why we, we probably weren't as good as we should have been offensively. But Maurice Carthon. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm glad you said it. <laughs> um, but we're over, overcoming some of those things. And, and then again, Charlie Fry is a, a friend to th this day. Uh, oh, Derek awesome. Anderson's a friend to this mm -hmm. day. So that room 
uh, Rip, Derek, Charlie, myself, um, and you put in Steve Hyden and Aaron Shea, you know, lifelong friends. Yeah. Um, developed some really neat relationships in that time. And uh, I, I regret that we couldn't have played at a higher – I regret that I couldn't have stayed healthy. I think if I could have stayed healthy, uh, we could have turned that thing around. Been an 8-8 eight eight type team that year. Uh, probably launched us into something better in years to come. But I think we did through Derek. You know, I think if you look back at it, Charlie and I didn't have a ton of success. But Derek ended up having a lot of success. And I think he would probably tell you this. A lot of that came from how he watched – me mm -hmm. rip do our business you did say that and actually. become perfect you know show them what it looks like to be a professional quarterback and then he had the juice right he was young he was um you know at full potential and i think he learned some of the things from us and he went on to have some pretty pretty solid success well, what was crazy too is that he he kind of it's similar to your season with the ravens is that he has that pro bowl season in 2007 and he doesn't even know if he's going to be back with the browns and it just they, they it seems like just like a revolving door of quarterbacks and it has been obviously from your shoes why do you think it just hasn't worked out you know i don't know i when i was there it felt as if the organization was too uh um too wishy-washy mm -hmm. that they listen to um, people's opinions too much. You know, you have to have conviction. You have to have a plan. You have to have conviction. You got to stick through it. You stick to it through hard times. Uh, I, I never saw that when I was there in Cleveland, and and when I got there, look, listening to people and looking back, it seemed as that had been the history that they became knee-jerk reactors based on public um, opinion. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know. I really haven't followed it that closely since. Probably good for your mental health. Yeah, I haven't followed that closely since. Uh, it seems as if they're steadying the ship. You know, I, my outside-in perspective the last couple of years looks as if they they have more of a plan. They have more um, consistency in what they're trying to do. They obviously went through a tough deal with Deshaun, um, but they have one of the better quarterbacks in the league now. Um, they have organizational stability. So it feels as if they're getting ready to turn the corner. But I know you that live in Cleveland uh, are pessimistic by nature. And don't, Heard that every year. You don't know. believe it's going to They're turning the corner every year. I know. They always win the offseason. It they win the feels draft. as if, from an outsider looking in, that well, they have found some stability. They have the right pieces. Now they just have to you know, make it work. What are some things, I suppose, behind the scenes that um, maybe some – Browns fans or NFL fans don't know about going through and playing quarterback there? You know, I don't have anything bad to say. I, I actually, no, no, just, yeah, I really enjoyed my time there. Um, it's your agenda here. Yeah, we, we loved our time in Cleveland. Um, my daughters still talk about it. It was so new for us. Yeah. Um, but the people were great. Um, we, we enjoyed where we lived. Uh, we enjoyed the people that we hung out with there. Uh, obviously, I wish I could have played better, wish I could have stayed healthy, but I don't really have anything bad to say about Cleveland. I, um, I left because more of a family thing than not mm -hmm. wanting to be a Cleveland Brown. Yeah. You know, Scott McLuhan and, and Savage kind of friend, you know, all mutual friends kind of did a favor to us to trade me to San Francisco because everybody I was going to retire at that point. It was kind of like, right off in the sunset, yeah. be a mentor for a few years and, and then retire. So uh, they provided that avenue for me. But uh, it, I actually enjoyed my time there. And outside of the person you met, um, really felt like um, it was a value add in my stops. That's good. Um, so you retired uh, in 2007. You had a nine-year career with ESPN. You had a segment called Dilford Dimes. <laughs> and uh, we went to the trophy shop down the street. And got you a paperweight Dilfer oh, Dime. Oh, let's go. Yeah. Dilfer Dime. Yeah. UAV Blazers, 2001. That's pretty cool, guys. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. That I was actually one of the funner things I was able to do. TV was fun. TV was a nice little second career. Did How many years did I do? Nine, I, I think? I think nine. I think I did nine years in TV. Was it – Um, I, I know a lot of quarterbacks, after they uh, retire from the NFL, they're trying to find that void of being yeah. in the locker room, the camaraderie and all that stuff. Did it like fill that void partially? It, yeah, and I remember vividly the conversation. I, I had an opportunity to go into upper management in the NFL, an opportunity to be a quarterback coach in the NFL right away. Um, 
And then I had the opportunity in TV and the family was kind of torn. I just had my 14th concussion and my career ended on a concussion. What, 14th? Yeah. 14th? Yeah. And my career ended, I was knocked out of candlestick for three minutes um, in 2008. So my family, you know, it was kind of a family decision. The girls were now old enough to kind of have say in the decision making process. Mm -hmm. and. It was, it was a consensus that whatever I did, it was kind of my time to chase the family instead of them chase me. I remember one of our executives, I won't use her name, thought it was the stupidest thing ever when it was launched. <laughs> um, no, we're not going to do that. That's, that's not what we do at ESPN. And next thing you know, it's the most popular segment oh, on yeah. Monday nights. And Baker Mayfield, oh. University of Oklahoma's quarterback. We're going to call this the technology dime for a couple of reasons. First of all, just appreciate it. Rips it down the boundary to start the game. That's beautiful. But I think Baker Mayfield might be a robot. Because watch him take the shot. But here's the best part. He doesn't go down. He watches it. And then the pylon can't be. Um, a lot of people worked really hard on that, and we had fun with it. And I liked it because it celebrated quarterbacks. You know, you'd go through that Sunday cycle. I'd do the Sunday Night Sports Center, and there'd be that cycle of negativity, 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 negativity. And then I was able to put some goodness on the day with the quarterback stuff, the dimes, and be able to take a Harvard quarterback throwing a walk off against Yale, or you know, a, a guy that didn't make the Sports Center highlights that day, mm -hmm. you know, show him make an insane throw. You know how great it was to see a Browns quarterback on a Dilford dime. Like, yeah, maybe it isn't that bad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We we do. I remember Derek on it a few times. Yeah, oh yeah. So the coolest thing about Dilford's dimes was it took an entire team to do it. Like I didn't make those cut ups. I didn't make those clips. Now, as a group all day long, we'd be watching for games, watching for throws. We'd review them as a group. I'd work with the P on, PA on building the graphics. Then we'd have those graphics approved by a producer. And like it felt like a team again. Like We're yeah. all in it for some two and a half minute segment. But everybody felt like, oh, this is a segment on Monday nights that a lot of people watch and a lot of people engage with. So why wouldn't we give it our best? So yeah, so you've experienced just about everything you, you can in this in NFL playing, uh, doing Elite 11 um, at Litscombe Academy, winning a couple state championships in high school. And then what, what led you here? What, why, uh, why UAB and what can, we, what can we expect to see from the team what are you, in 2023? The easiest way to say it is I, I loved our time at Lipscomb. I never thought I'd be a high school coach, uh, but it was what I needed at the time. It was where God took me. It was exactly what my family my, and I needed, um, and I think that community needed it. We were kind of done. There was nothing more we really could do there. Um, and I was looking for the next giant hill to climb, to be honest with you. It goes back to do hard things and be uncomfortable. We'd gotten to the point at Lipscomb where we were never going to lose. We are only going to be better every year. Yes, we could have continued to positively impact kids' lives and all that stuff. We also helped leave a, leave a foundation of that stuff in place where those kids were still going to be positively impacted and become better men through the vehicle of football. What was the next challenge for us? And the next challenge was um, rebuilding a program, remodeling a program. Um, I wasn't looking to be a college coach. I didn't have a resume. I didn't do any formal interviews. I didn't call anybody. I didn't have an agent. Um, and people are like, that's crap. Everybody, I'm like, I didn't. Like, I didn't have any of those things. Um, people reached out to us. And uh, as I started going down the road with UAB specifically, it felt right. I wanted to be in the Southeast. I do think football matters more in the Southeast. Um, it, it's part of, it's ingrained into the culture. Um, the type of football player we have here in Alabama is um, is unique. It's elite athletically, but it's 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 kind of competitive makeup is, is better than I've been around other parts of the country. Uh, it's a school that uh, has incredible opportunity for the student athlete. It's in a great city, uh, and moving to a new conference, playing SEC teams. You know, it, it's kind of got all the. Uh, all the ingredients of something that can be special. And, and um, I, I do think we're going to be pretty darn good. I've always been bullish. If I thought we were going to suck, I would say it. But I don't think that. I, I think we have really good players. We have great coaches. We have a support system. Um, 
that helps us become successful and I look for us to do some great things. Yeah, we talked to a few people across around town and they just uh, they just can't say enough good things about you how you've embraced the city have you you've embraced the food scene and just just being the, the Unfortunately head coach. a little bit too much. Well me much. too. No, we Golly. went everywhere yesterday. Yeah. No, but um, they just have, they've said nothing but good things about you. So and and so is everybody else along the way. Derek Anderson last week when we were in Arizona. So uh, just wish nothing but the best for you here, and can't wait to see uh, what happens with the team. I appreciate you guys. Thanks cool. for doing this. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the time. Yeah. Really appreciate you got it. it.